There you go. Okay. Good evening and welcome to the Salem Kaiser School Board uh, School District uh, Budget Committee meeting for March 19, 2019. And I'll start just by real quick uh, taking a poll of who's here and who's not here this evening. Um, we know that uh, Rachel Dewey Thorsett will not be here, uh, Kathy Goss will not be here, Chuck Lee will not be here, and it looks like we have a couple other folks who I believe are running late. Um, so Adriana will be a little late, and I have we heard from Adam? No? Okay. Okay, but we, we're all set, and I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, for everyone being here probably on the nicest day of the year so far i think it's like 75 degrees outside and about 80 in here so thank you for being here mm -hmm. so we are going to uh tonight's meeting is um, information for us as a budget committee and so we're going to have various reports and information provided by uh district staff and so we're going to start with an overview of the legislative process and school funding update and that's going to be provided by Mike Wolf. Superintendent Perry. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, in your packet, you have a uh, flyer that says the time is now to for Salem Kaiser School District and our students. This is our uh, legislative ag advocacy flyer. And um, so uh, I'll talk about the purpose of this is to really set the stage for um, if there is additional funds and if there are additional funds that are allocated to K-12 education. So um, the way the legislature is talking about this is around a, a billion dollar school improvement fund. If we get a billion dollar school improvement fund, it means um, about 34 million to Salem Kaiser each year of the biennium. And uh, there'll be requirements with how to spend the dollars. And the, do the four buckets are student health and safety, class size and additional adults, and more learning time, and then well-rounded education. And so um, this narrative is to give a high level um, what would we spend dollars on if there were a school improvement fund? It does not go down deep into detail at all because we want to provide flexibility. Because if you got 34 million, that's different than if you got 12 million. Um, I prioritize student health and safety because that's the thing we hear the most across the district um, is uh, trauma in students, mental health, uh, safety of all of our kids in our schools. So that's why that one is first. Uh, so uh, we do not have any sense right now, um, unless somebody else has a better crystal ball than I do, of whether or not we'll get a school improvement fund. And uh, for the budget, I'm not budgeting for the school improvement fund. Uh, at, at this point in the process, just because we don't have a good estimate of for sure that we would get that. Marty. Just a question. Yep. The school improvement fund is different than the CTE fund, correct? Correct. Oh, okay. correct. Yep. So this is would be a wonderful thing. This would be a huge investment in public education in Oregon, and it is something we all should expect of our legislators to figure out a way to do this. So this is the hopes and dreams. Uh, we, um, in December, got a um, budget from the, governor, from the governor. She, um, the investment from the governor's office for Salem-Kaiser is a current service level. It is, means that what we have today, we can roll up into next year and um, barely, and be, I'll just be really clear, barely maintain our current service level. Um, there are districts in Oregon that are not current service level with the governor's budget. Uh, school districts just to the north are losing hundreds of um, educators through at the governor's proposed budget. Um, we have um, a number of factors um, that just uh, make it a current service level budget for us, including we've not um, over budgeted in staffing. It's the escalation of staffing costs that really um, gets you in a down biennium. Um, so uh, at the governor's budget, we're current service level, barely, keep that in mind, barely. Um, and um, 
it, my intent right now is to propose a budget at the governor's budget. We'll get more information each week um, at the legislative process. Uh, the co-chairs have come out with a budget. Uh, the co-chair's budget is $100 million less than the governor's. Uh, for Salem-Kaiser, that means we would reduce by $3.5 million each year in the biennium. So um, we're in the crystal ball stage of budgeting where we don't really know what to expect of our revenue. And my guess is we won't know the final number until after you've uh, um, approved a budget. And we'll make our best prediction and have the what if there's more and what if there's less scenarios. So that's kind of the state of where we are. Um, legislatively, they're not talking a lot about the state school fund in the past uh, couple weeks. Um, hopefully, it'd be really awesome if they'd get back on that, but it, it will also be important that we get a number that's at least the governor's number, if not higher. And the governor's number is not hold harmless for a lot of districts including most in the Portland metro area. So I'll stop there for questions. Yes. So I just wanted to <clears throat> restate. So probably about 3.5 million loss, but we should be able to absorb that without loss of FTE? No. Um, so uh, if the governor's budget is what um, comes forward in the state school fund, we will be o kind of okay. If we get less than the governor's budget. So the legislator's budget, which is less, then mm -hmm. we're not. If we get that one, then we're oh, not okay. okay. And 3.5 million, we would have to lose FTE. We couldn't do it okay. in just tightening things. Okay. Um, if, now I'm not saying this is what we do, but to equate that to numbers, if we uh, had to reduce that much and we just reduced it in licensed teachers, which we wouldn't, we'd do it different ways, but it, that would be 33 licensed teachers so, is the number. So if if the, it goes ahead with ac the governor's actual mm -hmm. budget, then we would be able to basically tread water and not lose FTE. It's if the legislative budget goes Correct. through, which yep. is less, then we would have some issues to yep. deal with. Yep. The um, other part of your earlier question, Marty, was about uh, CTE dollars, that measure 98, or high school success dollars. In the, I think in both the governor's and the co-chair's budget, it's flat funded. So it's funded at a similar level to what has been funded the past few years, which, you know. It's not been all of the amount we're supposed to No, have. it's about, I think it's 60, 60%? <clears throat> percent? Not, a little more than half of what was voted on by the voters. But, um, and flat funding, you know, we have escalation of costs, so we have to be careful about the staffing part of that. But um, what we're, our crystal ball is hopeful for is a minimum of flat funding. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, so next up is um, a continuation from our last meeting, which was with regards to the equity questions that we as committee members, um, came up with in groups and uh, shared those with Craig and Linda. And so they are gonna uh, give us some responses to the questions that we had about the equity lens. Thank you. All right, so this is the uh, next few pages behind your agenda in your packet. And so we'll briefly talk through the questions that were provided to us and our responses there in the text. And then we can field any questions that you have in addition to that. So uh, the first question is, wondering about the allocated resources in HR for hiring and retaining a diverse workforce. And you'll see the response there is mostly focusing on our Grow Your Own programs. So the 18-19 budget included about $360,000 for those programs. Those include targeted uh, efforts to identify staff in special education, bilingual staff, and what we call our diversity pathway. So specifically seeking educators and administrators of color to join the uh, employee ranks in the district. So, and those will continue. Question two changes to the topic of CBOC. And so the Community Bond Oversight <coughs> Committee, the question is having to do with how are their allocated funds reviewed for schools within a boundary. And so the CBOC by definition provides oversight of the bond projects 
and there's a separate group of people, the design teams, who are school-based and school-specific, and that team uh, works the conceptual design through the final plan, and if through that design process there are identified needs that are outside the current scope of the project and additional funding is required, then those requests would go back to the superintendent, and if needed, those would actually go back to CBOC and the school board. So that's how those are all arranged. Question three uh, and question four actually have to do with what Superintendent Perry was just describing to you, so we don't need to spend too much time on that, but question three is dealing with the what happens if we do receive less funds than the governor's budget and, and what does that mean and how will we respond? And really that has to do with our need to prioritize. So if we have fewer resources, how do we ensure that the resources that we do have are prioritized to target the specific needs of our underserved students? On the converse of that, if we do get the governor's funds and school improvement funds, and those are in four buckets, which uh, Superintendent Perry already described to you, that would look like specific targeted expenses, most likely in the prioritized areas of social emotional learning and extended time for our underserved students. Typically, that would look like a summer school program. Can Next. I add just one thing? Yep. And part of that process that we've already started to undertake is to get voice from our populations on how they think we could move the dial for some of our underserved populations. So we are already trying to get input from people in schools and um, groups who are working with these kids and see if, is there something that we haven't done so far that we could try with, uh, to implement with these dollars um, if we get the dollars. Question five on the top of the back side. Um, we made a guess about the contextual topic of this question, and so essentially the question said, outline of when changes were made and why were they made. Uh, we took that question and responded to it with essentially a history of the equity lens and how was the equity lens adopted by the board and what were the changes that were made to that. If you were the person who wrote that question and that wasn't the intent of the question, will you let me know and we can come back and revisit um, but we made some assumptions on where we thought that question was targeting. Number six, what have we done equity-wise compared to last year? So specifically, you are certainly aware of the intentionality in collecting stakeholder voice throughout the boundary process, and we changed the manner in which we heard from our stakeholders by identifying strategies that were more conducive to bringing families to us, and that was essentially by going to them in their communities, hosting uh, community forums at schools like Four Corners, uh, Waldo, and, and bringing families to their home turf, places where they're already comfortable engaging in school-based topics. So um, that's one example. Obviously, the other example, as far as equity work, the focus right now on responding to emergent student needs, and the school board has heard some recent presentations on how are we identifying the students who are dealing with trauma and how does that display itself in the regular classroom during a day of learning, and what are the specific types of responses that we're trying to put in place for those kids. So all of those designed to ensure equitable outcomes for our students. And then number seven, this I believe is just a good reminder for us. I don't know that this was actually a question, but the comment was to answer some of the questions in the equity questions and budgeting slide uh, when we are reviewing proposed reductions and additions. So just as a reminder, these are the questions that we committed to you to utilize as we dig into actual budget preparation. And so those questions are, who is impacted by the budget decision? How has input from impacted stakeholders been considered? How would that budget decision reduce disparities and advance equity or inclusion? And what are the possible unintended outcomes of the decision and what are steps taken to mitigate those? So those are the questions that we uh, provided for you in the presentation itself, and those are the questions that we have committed to ensuring that we review as we dig into actual budget uh, decisions and priorities. So for number eight, we really felt like this question gets at the heart of equity work, and, uh, and it's something which is speaks to the messiness of equity work. So I'm just gonna read the question um, in full really quickly. So how will past inequitable situations be corrected? 
who will be responsible or accountable for making and correcting the past inequity situations? How will inequities be prioritized if there are different opinions about the problems and what needs to be corrected? That question gets at the heart of um, why equity work is difficult. And it's because we're going to have differ differing perspectives on how to do this work based on, our, based on our own perspectives and the communities that we're representing. We all represent different communities in the, in the school district. So I guess the, the commitment that you have from us is that we will continue to ask these questions. The question on who is responsible for this work, we are, and so are you. Um, we're in this together to be able to make these changes. There is, there is no group outside of us that is more responsible than we are um, as decision makers in the district. So, so I think that question really frames up a lot of our equitable discussions. And the whole idea of, of looking at things through an equity lens is to recognize that our results and our outcomes haven't been equitable. So to recognize that and to take steps to address that is our charge. The number nine is related to that. Who is the authority to call foul if a decision is not equitable? Mm -hmm. And this depends on when in the budgeting process it occurs. I can tell you, as we've been talking budgeting a lot internally, a lot of us have been calling foul when we think we're not quite sure that that addresses what we want it to address internally. How can we have those hard conversations amongst ourselves? When, the budge, when Superintendent Perry presents her budget, you're going to hear a lot of different perspectives from community members and weighing those perspectives and trying to think is their opportunity to say, we believe this is great or maybe not and call foul as well. So there, it's, it kind of depends on when the process of when the budget is being proposed, created, and then eventually adopted. So how will data on inequity be determined, collected, and shared? Our school board is committed to looking at data in a disaggregated way, which forces us just not to say, you know, 44% of our kids are making these gains because 44% of our kids aggregated together may be making the gains, but there may be groups that are only making 10% gains and some groups making 60. And when you squash it together, it looks, it looks possibly okay, but there could be um, differences in outputs there. So that's one way that we share data with our board and they hold us accountable to that data. So the question number 11 is how do we address emerging issues such as suicide? And as you all know, suicide is something on the hearts and minds of, of many of our employees and staff and students and our school board as well. And we've been able to use um, some of our funding through the Office of Behavioral Learning to start addressing those needs in kind of a flexible way throughout the year. So there's going to be emerging needs um, every year, and we try to meet those flexibly with an equity lens. Number 12 is about business support and PTC, PTA support. And so how are we making sure that those funds are equitably sourced across the district? For PTC and PTA funds, we don't share them across the district in our district model right now. We do try to look at those funds of one source of funds when we are thinking about general fund dollars to be able to, to, be able to look at, for instance, an after school program. There are some communities that can support a for-profit after school program and uh, raise money to be able to do that. And there are some of ours that aren't. We don't want access restricted opportunity. That's part of that opportunity gap. We want to mitigate that through our general fund dollars. So while we don't spread PTC and PTA dollars across, we do use those to be able to frame how are we trying to fund equitable opportunities. Um, some sports um, would be another example of that, to be able to have kids have equitable opportunities. The number 13 isn't related specifically um, to a budgeting question, but it's how we're monitoring um, impact of students with emergent um, behavioral needs. We monitor the impact of those students, but how is that impacting our classroom communities? And we, we don't have great impacts on um, it could be called tertiary trauma in an article that I wrote, uh, not wrote, read. Um, um, I get made fun of for uh, bragging too much about my dissertation, so that uh, 
that, I'm going to hear about that one. Um, so when I read, I did not come up with the word tertiary trauma. Um, and, it, and it's about that, it's about that idea. How does it impact a school community? It's something we're very aware of, and it's something that we're, we're trying to balance the needs of, of both, both communities, communities of kids who are impacted themselves by these emergent needs. We know there are some of our lowest high school graduates are the kids who are, are experiencing these needs coming out of traumatic situations, but also it impacts our overall communities as well, so we try to balance that. Number 14 is related to Title funding and Title I funding. And I think the question is, can we have Title funding follow the student who qualifies for Title funding versus follow the community? And the way that, that Title I funding is allocated from the federal government down to us is free and reduced numbers in a school community, which means you may be in a, in a relatively affluent school community but experiencing poverty yourself but that affluent school community doesn't receive title one funding because they don't meet the mark of 50 percent of kids are free and reduced so the, the question is how is that and how do we provide supports again that's the fluidity of general funding supports for us to be able to provide a blanket or a foundation of all kids getting access to a guaranteed and viable curriculum all kids, that's why we, when we talk about MTSS or multi-tiered systems of support, that we can differentiate and meet the needs of all learners regardless if they're in a title school or not. Um, and that's partially why we're trying to get some coherence across the district with those models. Um, our math program would be another good example. Regardless of what school you go to in Salem-Kaiser, you're gonna get that guaranteed and viable curriculum, whether it's a title school or not. And then 15. Uh, hey, Craig, I'm sorry. Yes, can, I'm I sorry. A, can I ask you a quick question on uh -huh. that? Um, sorry, so the last sentence of your response, um, it's talking about the boundary adjustments increasing the number of students in poverty at a few of our high schools, um, but their percentages remain significantly lower than the other two schools. Um, I, I appreciate that comment, however, this is the question that we've been asking. Um, it's still an impact to uh, the, you know, the, the new high schools. Mm -hmm. Um, going to be less too. So, um, although it's still relatively low compared mm -hmm. to the others, I just I'd, I think that there have been some concerns and questions about that uh, because these students um, may have additional needs and they have those resources um, at their uh, current school, but that may not be the case when they get to their you know the new high school. So. I don't know that I really have a question. I'm just trying to better understand the response right. and how we're going to ensure that these students are well ca yeah. cared for. So we have multiple instances where students come up through an elementary school that may qualify for Title I services, but then transition into secondary schools, into a high school specifically that does not receive Title I. Right. Part of that is accomplished by the economy of scale in what you have as far as the ability to take care of students. Um, and you'll see a little bit of that as we look at class size and the intentionality and some master scheduling and some choices at the middle school and high school level in order to meet the supports of individual kids. The other piece that is separate from Title I funding is the EL funding that comes along with students. So in the specific uh, situation that you're describing, which I'm assuming is south, and the increased uh, number of students who will be coming from Four Corners and Mary Air. And remember, as those students transition over, those kids are entitled to, uh, if they still are in an EL program and they haven't exited, then they're entitled to uh, ELD services specifically as one period in their schedule and some additional supports through IAs, both of which come out of the general fund, not out of title funds. So. I do think that we have uh, a decent idea about some of the ways that we can be strategic in meeting some of the needs at South. Uh, I also believe that we will need to have some continued conversations and see what we need to meet over the course of time. We have components like reserve FTE or things that we leave to be able to meet needs after the school year starts. And so our ability to be nimble and responsive to Sprague after the school year starts or even right as the school year starts once we have a really solid handle on which kids are showing up um, we certainly are maintaining the heightened awareness of how we need to be have the ability to respond on yeah. a short period and the of time. other tricky part we just have to keep in mind too is we have the uh, supplant issue 
So we have to fund the base mm -hmm. the same across all the high schools in, a, in some sort of a formulaic, systematic way. Mm -hmm. If we add to one school that isn't a title school, right. that means we also have to, and we'd have to have a systematic reason, we'd also have to add to North and McKay. So any one FTE is really three to six, depending on how much. So that's the other piece of it that's at play that we just have to figure out through the staffing process. And, and, and that makes perfect sense. Um, but when you're talking about an additional 300 plus students um, coming from Title yeah. I schools. And like I said, we'll have to see. I don't believe we'll be seeing that number. We've looked at some continued average annual enrollments and rolled up the numbers with the boundary changes. Um, and I believe our numbers are indicating more like about like 100 kids. Um, so we'll need to figure out who actually shows up and make sure that we have the ability to be responsive as soon as they as soon as they're there. Can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. So we're talking about South, right? Okay. How how close um, is South to flipping to Title One? Not even close. So Dang actually, it. South is not next in line. There is okay. so McNary is actually the next closest. So the distinction is somewhere between 75 and 80 percent mm -hmm. of our high schools that qualify for Title One, and both South and McNary are in the 30s. Okay. And so South currently is in the mid 20s, and they will move to the low to mid 30s. So it is a, it's a jump of, you know, eight to ten percentage points, sure. which will feel significant, yeah. but again, not um, 35 to 75 or. Um, and they and the goal is well, not the goal. Sorry, <laughs> the the kind of the the number is 50 percent. The number is 50 percent at okay. elementary school. Okay. Um, we haven't had to set. A specific target because we have such a disparity right. um, we currently are funding at 75 percent okay. for our high schools if we had another school jump into a 50 percent range we would certainly um, have to have some conversations about what that would look like but remember you fund on a per pupil basis mm -hmm. and the pot of money doesn't change so if you right. have more students in poverty you don't you don't get more money you mm -hmm. just are spreading that pot of money thinner okay. so um, we would have to have some serious conversations about what it would look like to bring a whole other high school on board um, and what that would mean for funding across the entire system. Okay, thank you. In fact, we have elementary schools with higher poverty than a couple of our, than three or four of our high schools that don't get title funding. Okay. Yeah. They're elementary. Yeah. yeah. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank okay. you. Okay. Um, and then the, the last one is, what do you perceive as the biggest equity obstacle this year? And funding is by far, if we had unlimited funds, equity is really easy. If, if you have funds where you can say, well, South can be a title school and North and McKay and McNary, and we could equitably think about that, um, it's, it's an easier decision. I think the next level of work for our equity work, which is somewhat related to budgeting, but not specifically, is around culturally relevant teaching practices. Because we need to get equity, not just a discussion that's happening in the boardroom or happening on decision-making structures, but it, we need to have equity infused into how we're greeting kids, how we're setting up our curriculum to reach all kids, how we're measuring the difference that that makes in the lives of students. That's ult our ultimate watermark here is, is it making a difference for our students? And that's through culturally relevant teaching. I guess I have, I have a quick question. Um, so the last presentation that you gave to the board, I hear, or to the um, budget committee, was on our, um, our graduation rates and um, you know some things came to our attention and so will that be part of the budget discussion later um, about how to really specifically address the graduation rates and the decline in um, the, the numbers yeah. and the information um, around two of our, our yeah. populations? If we um, put ads into the budget related to those subgroups, that would be when it would come in the budget message. I, I will talk a little bit about outcomes in there. And if we don't do it there, uh, we need to talk strategy in the boardroom. Okay. So if it's not a budget ad, it doesn't pertain to, then we'll talk strategy in the board, boardroom. Okay. Yeah. I've got a question. Mm -hmm. um, and I apologize if you've already addressed this previously, but and going back to question one regarding to uh, diversity in the workforce, um, can you speak to where we are as far as what our workforce currently looks like? Mm. 
<laughs> we both look at the HR director. <laughs> can he speak to that? I can't off the top of my head. We year. can certainly yeah. do that. We can change. Yeah. We um, we're we're not we don't reflect our student um, our students. Um, we um, have strategies in place that's just gradually increasing. We are a better reflection in our classified ranks than we are in our licensed and administrators. And uh, last year we did add a number of administrators of color um, to in some of our schools. So that doesn't give you a percentage. We are making incre incremental process progress and every time we l lose one then it steps us back that's on our report card data it is yeah it's on our report card data from ODE oh look at look at there's the land with it is what I would add if I oh. may oh. be thank you Jim awesome. so our staff demographics um, currently have about 14 percent of our staff are Hispanic and more like 40 percent of our students are Hispanic two percent of our staff are Asian that's about commensurate American Indian at 1% is about commensurate. African American, 1%, um, our African American student population is closer to three, I believe. Um, and we have less than 1% of our Pacific Islander, of our staff, excuse me, our Pacific <coughs> Islander. So 82% of our staff are white. And so that's where, mm -hmm. that's the disparity. So the next question I have, uh, essentially Thanks, the same Lord. line is, you said in the second paragraph that we're doing a good job of hiring diversity in proportion to our candidate pool. So are you saying that our candidate pool is not diverse? Yeah, so really this needs to become a recruiting strategy. Um, when the majority of the applicants are white and you have a majority of, of white applicants to select from, um, we have struggled having a diversity in the people who are actually completing and submitting applications. So it really is a recruiting issue as much as it is a hiring issue. And that gets out a little bit to our Grow Your Own programs, right. where we're trying to identify students who are undergrads and invest in them so that we can increase the diversity of our pool. So um, of those Western students that are graduating this spring that are bilingual, are we uh, snagging any of those? Yeah, the bilingual scholars all come to us. Yeah, they actually, when they started at Western as freshmen and they got the bilingual scholars scholarship or pathway, their um, technical obligation is to come teach for us. What's that? The scholarships for us. Um, no, it's a financial aid package, and we select them. Thank you. So, yeah, they're coming back. I think, And I think we might have four or five that will start. Uh, next year. Uh, John, did you have, you wanted to add something? Okay, okay, thank you. Jesse? Oh, yeah, so um, I know as a board, we went over a lot of our hiring practices, and we saw the charts of who's applying, who's coming in, and kind of the strategies. I think that'd also be a great thing for the budget committee to hear, just because a lot of them weren't there for that. And as we're talking about budgets, I think uh, Ms. Hart is right to say that that's something that's on a lot of our minds. And I think it'd be a good thing for us to go over as a budget committee. So um, kind of to go off of your question, um, do we have any idea for the different teaching programs maybe in the state or in, in Oregon and some of the surrounding states, what percentage are Caucasian versus other, you know, some minorities? So we have an idea of, you know, yeah, I don't what know. What there might actually be right. coming down the pike. We as do have far a director of recruiting. Teachers. I do know this answer again what? because of my. No. <laughs> and I hate to admit it, but this is part. So ninety. When I two years ago, ninety percent of candidates who were coming out of our Oregon schools with an education degree were white. Oh. So we we still have a lot of work to do mm -hmm. in our education programs, and most of them headed toward elementary were also women. So we turn out a lot of white women who are teaching in our elementary schools across the board in, in Oregon. Yeah. We have worked to do some recruiting in California. The one place where we've found the closest place to find with the most diverse candidates was in, I think, Sacramento. Um, and the further we go away from Oregon, even if we get applicants and we hire them, the harder it is to retain them because they often will go back home. 
They don't like Oregon. They don't like rain. No, it's, I don't rain. think it's that they don't like Oregon. I think they miss family. Yeah, so they would move away from their family to be here. And that's why we're turning our attention to our own kids, our own employees, our own community in order to um, really build our Encourage workforce. Encourage them to mm -hmm. become educators. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, um, so I had question number seven about um, answering the questions in the, in the slide. So thank you for your response. And I, so I definitely trust that it's been done. But I think something that I, um, specifically what I'm thinking is in, in the budget presentation, I would like to see some very specific, mm -hmm. uh, more detailed um, information about, um, espe especially when it comes to reductions. Like last year we had the issue around um, the LE. Bilingual. Yeah, yeah, bilingual. Yeah. So right. yep. it would have been with something like that that could be more mm -hmm. of a of a big issue with with some of the mm -hmm. community members to have uh, some information for the budget committee to consider whether you know uh, mm -hmm. what kind of homework has the this, the staff done yeah. to uh, to assert if if it will have a negative impact or not and who have you gone out mm -hmm. to uh, that would be nice if it's if it can be included at some level in the budget message. Mm -hmm. yeah, since that budget message will be seen by the entire community, that would be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so next is PERS, and this one is Mike. Yes, so, um, Get ready for an uplifting conversation about public employee retirement system. Uh, so a uh, couple of things. Just in the overview, um, wanted to call out your attention. PERS is one of our largest cost drivers. In fact, it um, has surpassed our health insurance, employee health insurance. And um, for reference, on page 100 in the 1819 budget, you'll see sort of the roll-ups of um, the general fund, and you'll see that We've budgeted in 1819, the current budget, a little over $71 million for PERS and a little over $66 million for health care. So you can see that those two cost drivers pushing $140 million in our general fund budget, and we have very little to no control over either of them. Uh, similarly, we have very little to no control over our revenue. So you can see it's a pretty tough proposition to uh, run uh, half a billion dollar general fund when you've got cost drivers such as this. So part of what we wanted to do, and we did this last year as well, was give you just sort of the PERS 101. So you had some basics. Now remember the PERS uh, board consists of five members, and that was a, a reform that was put in place several years ago. And um, so uh, one of the big issues that people talk about is the unfunded actuarial liability, which is really uh, the debt um, and the shortfall in funds to cover what is needed to pay current and future benefits. So at the statewide level, it's estimated to be uh, around $26.6 billion. That's an increase because of market performance in 2018. Uh, near the end of 2018, things didn't go so well. And so it's an estimate. Um, our district valuation, though, for our UAL, our unfunded actuar actuarial liability, as of uh, December 31st, 2017, which is the formal valuation, was um, $363.5 million. Now, just to give you some context, in January of 2015, the board approved the issuance of a little over $50 million in pension obligation bonds, which extinguished our UAL at the time. So at the beginning of 2015, mm -hmm. our UAL, after issuing the $50 million, was zero. And here we are. Um, wow. The valuation at the end of 2017, two years later, at <coughs> over $363 million of UAL. And that's mostly driven by market performance. Um, so that's just sort of the sobering nature of this conversation. And now that we're done with that, I can move into some of the other aspects of it. You can see in the sheet that um, PERS maintains three separate retirement programs. So you hear about the Tier 1, uh, Tier 2, and um, OPSERP employees. Um, and you can see when each of those went into effect. 
And then the chart shows you our PERS rate, tier one, tier two, OPSERP. Uh, we have our employee pickup, 6% that the district pays on behalf of our employees. And then the debt service, the PERS bonds, the pension obligation bonds that, that I've talked about. Um, and that's in fund 300. So if you wanted to actually look at the debt service uh, for those pension obligation bonds and the different issuances, going back to 2002, that's on page 185. Um, in case you didn't bring your budget with you, you can go online and take a look at those pages if you want to write them down. So you can see that um, every biennium, we have a new set of PERS rates, normal operating costs, the tier one, tier two, and OPSERP set for us for the biennium. And they're set in the odd year prior to the biennium. So the valuation in December, December 31st, uh, the actuarials take a look at the system to determine in December 31st, they, took a, they take a look at the system to determine the funding level of it. How unfunded is it in the, the UAL? And those rates are set for the next biennium. So the valuation in December of 2017 set the rates for the 1921 biennium that we're heading into. So the budget that we're, and this is all public, so the budget that we're going to be talking about is the 1920 budget. Those will include the higher rates, and you can see the difference in the chart on your page. So uh, for instance, tier one, tier two, that was about a 4.58% increase. Now remember, the current year we're in, 1819, is the last year of the 1719 biennium. So we're heading, that's why the rates are increasing uh, next year. And you can see, uh, again, for OPSERP, that's uh, about a f almost 4.5, 4.46% 4 increase. Our employee pickup is the same 6% every year. And our debt service on the pension obligation bonds is uh, static at this point until uh, principal and interest payments begin to increase over the years, which they do heading out into, I think it's 2027 is when we peak. So just something for, you know, the budget committee to consider as we move forward uh, in this budget and others that um, our debt service obligations will continue to increase as we move forward. And so the rate increase uh, that we see here represents approximately 12 million in additional PERS costs that will start in the 1920 um, budget. Any questions on that? Remember, these are payroll rates. So like for instance, uh, on the tier one, tier two, for 1920, that's about 36% total of payroll. So for every um, dollar that's spent on payroll, we have to add 36 cents just to cover PERS. That gives you a sense of um, sort of the load to the, the payroll rate. Any questions on the PERS? Mike, just to system. clarify, you said again that we expect these rates to go up through 2027? Well, our debt service rates, uh, you know, we need to keep track of the principal and interest payments in the future, so they will continue to rise a bit. And that's the 9% will go up a bit uh, over time. But the actual rates themselves, the per system rates, the normal operating cost rates, Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the projection is out to the 35-37 biennium. 3537 biennium before things start to level off and actually decline as far as payroll rates. So we're we're in it for a while. I told you this would be sobering. Um, so one of my questions is what are we doing now? Because you, you said 3536? 3537? 3537 biennium is the projection. Okay, because it seems like it's going to keep increasing until then. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So, so, um, so I guess my question would be, what are we doing to prepare ourselves for uh, that increase? Or are we going to eat some of the cost now so that way it's not as high of a yeah. Um, yeah. cost later? It, I, I think one of the things that we have to, um, it's we need to know what's coming our way, and um, we have to continue to, the annual process is limiting because it sort of focuses you on the next year, yeah. knowing that more more costs are coming. So in the past, what we've done, for instance, uh, budget committees in the board have, um, when we had May adjustments, let's say, uh, budget committee made recommendations to put some of the May adjustment into the PERS reserve fund to help with fluctuating costs. 
Uh, that was, I think we did that over a two year period and then added uh, more uh, payroll rate. Uh, it was about a nine million add to the PERS reserve over a three year process. Those types of activities help. Yeah, but we'll need, we'll need help at the legislative uh, level to curb any of those long-term costs. That's kind of out of our control at the local level. And the only way to really curb costs is to not hire people. Yeah. And that's, at the end of the day, it's people that change. So it's hard to think ahead and plan, yet know you've got students in front of you that need services today. So it is why uh, if they're in the first year of the biennium, if there are additions, I won't ever propose that additional funding all goes to staffing because I know in the second year those people cost more and over time that escalates. So if, if we can add, we try to add moderately and not uh, too many so that you can sustain the payroll increase costs over, the over time. That's good to know. Thank you. Purse has always been a hard thing for me to really <coughs> wrap my head around. So, you know, tier one, tier two, we have what, tier three and four maybe now. So, as these tiers, they don't have the same level of benefits as tier one and two. Has that provided any kind of offset to the mm -hmm. cost mm -hmm. to the district? It, it, it has over time. Um, our uh, the balance of our workforce has uh, shifted over time to where we were heavy in tier one, tier two employees, which costs more. You can see the payroll rates. Uh, and now we're, I think we're about even, aren't we, Sarah? Or uh, OPSERP a little bit, a little bit higher than tier one, tier two. So you can see uh, as, so OP as OP. right. And so the OPSERP okay. employees uh, obviously cost us less. You can see the payroll rates there. So over time, that will be to our benefit that we'll have younger employees and yeah. I'm a tier one I'm a tier one first retiree yeah. but uh, I think remember I we pay for we pay for the tier ones in that unfunded actuarial liability that's why that continues to rise because even as tier one <coughs> tier two retire we have an obligation to them so it helps because our we're over 50 percent in the OPSERP now but we also ha still have this 50 percent yeah right yeah okay. no. And so that's why, that's why you're, you're looking out to the 35, 37 biennium, um, just life expectancy. Right. I'll yeah. probably be dead by then. <laughs> Let's hope Marty. not. Let's, Let's hope not, not. Yeah. Marty. No, but I'll do my part. That's, that's not where we're going with this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It seems like it's tomorrow. Marty, quit. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay. I think you have the next one, too. I do, yeah. Transportation. transportation. Our transportation infrastructure report. So just so you know, our fleet consists of two components, yellow buses, school buses, and support vehicles. And um, we have one of the largest bus fleets in the region with about 274 uh, yellow buses of various sizes. We call them big and small. That's typically how you'll see them on, on the roads. And just to give you some stats, we provide over 22,000 student rides a day. Um, we also operate a very large support fleet of a, a little over 200 support vehicles that includes 36 trailers and one fire truck. It's the first fire truck I've ever purchased in my career. So thank you, uh, City of Salem, for putting that up for sale. Uh, and that supports the CTE program at West Salem. And so again, our combined fleet in 17-18 um, traveled over 3.5 million miles, consumed over 540 gallons of fuel. Um, our big buses average a little over 11,000 miles a year, and our small buses a little over 14. That's important because we have a target for replacement, a schedule that we've built, and it's based on those two components. So. Based on industry practices, our target for replacement is 200,000 miles for any bus, plus an additional threshold of 12 years of age for small buses and 15 for large buses. So if you're over 200,000 and you hit the age part uh, point, then you're, you're on our list to replace. The other thing to note is that our buses we receive 70% depreciation of the cost of the buses over a 10 year period, which means the bus actually cost us 30% as a district. 
but when they go off depreciation, we don't receive any revenue. So many of our buses are off depreciation. Once they hit the, the 10 year or 12 year mark, clearly the 11 year mark, they're clearly off uh, depreciation for us. And so you can see the chart below for our school bus fleet. And you can see the age column. Uh, we've got 123 buses in the 11 to 15 year range, 14 in the 15 plus. And then you look at marrying those ages up with the um, 200,000 mile threshold. And we have about uh, 90, uh, 44 big buses needing replaced, 93 small buses. The cost ranges between $100,000 for a small bus and $135,000 for a big bus. And so you can see how the numbers add up to a little over 15 million for our bus fleet to replace. I, well, question. Um, you know, with a car, sometimes highway ma miles aren't so bad as in-town miles. And I know we don't do as many field trips, which might have been highway miles. But do we differentiate at all between highway miles with our buses and in-town mileage? We really buses? don't because the vast majority of our daily trips are Just in city, town. city routes. Um, yeah. And um, the... The one component here, and we have lots of graphs that we could share, we just didn't put them in this one, <laughs> but the, there's a component of maintenance here. So obviously the older the vehicles get, just because they need to be replaced, well that's one conversation, but how much maintenance hour, how many maintenance hours go into keeping a bus that needs to be replaced running is uh, exponential over time. And if you drop down to the bottom here, and we can talk about the support vehicles as well, but you can see the columns are laid out remarkably similar to the uh, buses and you can see that we've got about one and a half million dollars of support vehicles that uh, clearly our need is in the bus fleet but if you look at the bottom you can see because we are maintaining so many buses beyond right their useful life according to our standards we are increasing the number of buses every year that just quit they're done engines are blown transmissions are shot it's not worth the money to put uh, a new engine into a, a bus uh, that's 15 years old. And so, let me finish this thought. Um, we're projecting approximately 10 to 12 buses uh, this next year will fail on us. And so, those come right out of the general operating fund, out of the, out of the transportation's budget uh, to maintain those. And all that does is replace buses that have broken, not the ones that Hopefully, the buses that break are the ones that are on the list to replace anyways. It's just not the most efficient way to go about replacing vehicles. So we were getting more buses for the boundary change, and those are only used for, what, three years, kind of? You know, well, yeah, those I think help for the us most at all part, in this or not? No, they're just additions to the fleet. They'll be used. Um, but it won't, help. it won't help take some of these off even after three years because the majority of them were just for the boundary change, not for transporting between the, uh, the kids that are staying at their old school and the new school. Right, so after the, like the three years, mm -hmm. you know, for the freshmen, you know. Yeah, and I don't think it helps us. Moved elsewhere to help. We would do it in a second if, if that's what the outcome is, but we're not predicting that will be the outcome. Yeah, and it honestly would be a drop in the bucket to the you know, uh, 100 plus, 150 plus that we need to replace well, at and this point. Just, I want to point our attention. It's not that we haven't been diligent because we have, um, we have 89 buses that are in the zero to five yeah. range. So in the last five years, we've purchased 89 new buses, um, but the, it just keeps, it's hard to keep up. The, the other thing I would say is what we don't want to do is create these bubbles. You can see the bubbles ripple rippling through 89 is zero to five in you know five to ten years there'll be an 89 bus bubble uh, the 123 that we're looking at in the 11 to 15 again so what we'd like to be able to do is stagger investments mm -hmm. even though we need to replace them as soon as possible it's better to replace them over a three to five year period than try to do it all at once Uh, what are the changes with OSAA? What sort of um, impact has that had on our transportation costs? Uh, just the overall general cost. I think we talked about that being, um, we think that was close to half a million or so 
is what we had anticipated going into the 1819 budget. Um, and we're still tracking uh, those costs, although I think the sports basketball was it. And then we'll see, I'm not sure what spring sports we have. We'll have a lot of yeah. trips over the mountain. Now. Yeah. So, so we're still tracking those so costs. So 500000 for Increase. what period of time, for the year or for the? Mm -hmm. We were thinking for the year. the year. Yeah. And don't quote me on that exact number. I think we started out higher, but then so got real creative in scheduling right. to try and squeeze that down. Thank you. Then, of course, we didn't make some trips over the past this year yeah. as well. The snow helped. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we need more yeah. snow. If it will come quick enough that we can cancel without having cancellation costs. <laughs> right. Or add more school days. Yes, or add more school days. Yep. <laughs> okay. Quick yes. Are there any, um, do we bear all of the cost of bus replacement, or are there federal grants that help offset the cost? No, we're not aware of any federal grants that offset the cost. Now, we've received some uh, grants from ODE around um, emission replacing engines uh, to be more efficient, but that's just maintaining a, our fleet as opposed to replacing them. Yeah. No, this squarely uh, falls on the uh, K-12 budget at the state level and the transportation grant. Not to get too much into the weeds here, but I think that was a good segue into the question of uh, when we're buying new buses, are we looking for one, like what do we keep in mind when we're doing the search? Are we looking for ones that consume less gas of this 540,000 gallons of fuel, or are they kind of just the same throughout? Um, no, that's a good question. We're always uh, looking, and of course <coughs> the manufacturers are trying to improve um, fuel efficiency as well. The problem is they're just big vehicles. They weigh a lot, you know, the, the engines are, aren't what I would call oversized uh, necessarily. Um, they're not speedsters, you know what I mean? But they're just not the most efficient. I mean, they're big, they're trucks, basically, really big trucks. So uh, it's much safer than a truck. Let me, if Michael Shields is watching, they're much <laughs> safer than a truck. Um, and we also have EDS or um, uh, bus specifications uh, from ODE, so there's certain types of vehicles we can and can't buy. And so typically, if there was a large bus purchase, we would go through a solicitation and pick a vendor, and they would actually be put in the production queue. So for us to buy a bus, they're built, typically, and um, that can take a good nine months lead time from the time you place the order until you receive it. And when they're being built, if we have large purchases, we actually uh, send our lead mechanic out to the manufacturing site to oversee some of it to make sure that our specs are, um, you know, a little QA, QC. So we do the best we can, but uh, they're not the most efficient vehicles, period. So, but, but do we keep it in mind, the footprint mm -hmm. that the buses are creating as we're purchasing them? The footprint, you say? Yeah. The carbon footprint? Yes. Um, yeah, I don't know that we have much choice in that. I mean, they are what they are. Now, we have even, um, we've looked at, our transportation department has looked at natural gas mm -hmm. as a fuel as well, and there's some interest, I believe, at the legislature around electric buses. The infrastructure just isn't in place to go full in on something like mm -hmm. that at this point. But we're always open. Uh, but our order of magnitude, the scale that we operate on, it's, um, you know, we, we've got to be able to meet the needs every day when we're talking about 22,000 student, student rides a day. But we are looking, for sure. So, so on that, just real quick, on that point, and then Jim, um, so I sit on the budget committee for um, Salem-Kaiser Transit District, and a few years ago, they purchased um, a handful of more economical. Yeah, read about that, yeah. Uh, but they're moving away from that. And I don't recall the reason, I can find out and share, but it didn't turn out to be such the um, cost savings that I think they had expected, so they're moving yeah. away from that. One of, the, one of the things, just so you know, that we struggle with is you, you want to standardize your fleet as much as possible from a maintenance standpoint. So the more one-offs you get, the harder it is to, to run the maintenance uh, department as well. Jim had a question. And Mike, we bulk purchase to save money, and we, I mean, when other school districts around us are looking to buy school buses, they 
piggyback onto our purchases so it helps lower our cost overall because we don't just go out and buy one bus at a time we're buying I think the last time you came to us, we bought like 22 buses, didn't we? It, it was, well, it was actually part of, as Su Superintendent Perry said, when you look at the zero to five, we actually had a, a, a group of But the last one we did a financing for at the board level, I think it was 22 you brought to us. Yeah. I mean, we, we buy down the price by buying them in bulk. Yes, yes, and we piggyback off other uh, contracts that are in existence as well. Like Eugene has an active contract now, so... Uh, when we look around, we make sure that we're partnering with the other school districts across the state. But you're right, it's a volume business. When you need buses, you really need to. But again, you create that bubble. And, you know, 10 years later, you're going to have that bubble to deal with. Okay. Thank you. So I think, Jim, you're up next to talk about CTE and Measure 98. Thank you. Uh, this should be more pleasant uh, because Measure 98 actually provides us with additional resources. Uh, and so that's been um, a pleasure to, to plan and coordinate throughout the school district. As a reminder, uh, we received about uh, 5.86 million last school year and 6.1 million for this current school year. And those funds are to be expended in three specific areas, career and technical education, dropout prevention, and college level coursework. And so the document that we've provided kind of details uh, some highlights of how we've utilized those funds. First, in expanding CTE programs, we've expanded CTE programs in all of our comprehensive high schools, at Roberts uh, as well, and at CTEC. We've phased, uh, we've used uh, Measure 98 funds or high school success funds to, to pay for uh, phase three and four of the uh, rollout at CTEC. So all of those, um, the school district costs for equipment and the school district costs for personnel have been coming out of those Measure 98 funds, which have kept those costs out of the general fund. Um, we've also uh, expanded um, a lot, of, a lot of money at each of the comprehensive high schools and at Roberts as well. And those are very different projects. Uh, each, each school has an has a, a allocation and they, and they kind of plan those out differently. So some will choose to uh, increase their FTE and some will choose to improve equipment and infrastructure. Uh, and that's really nice that Measure 98 allows us to have that flexibility to use those funds as we see fit in those areas. For dropout prevention, we've spent about $833,000. And that's provided a, a variety of different uh, credit recovery opportunities and summer transition programs, as well as our uh, establishing our ninth grade success teams at all of our high schools. And then uh, we've been able to utilize uh, the dollars that we um, over budget, uh, because we always budget very conservatively. Um, so we've been able to use those carryover dollars to uh, provide additional credit recovery uh, resources and, and options. And you can see a list of those different types of activities that our schools have done there at the, at the end of that paragraph. Measure 98 also allowed us to use up to 15% to engage students in eighth grade. Um, and so we've been able to, uh, to put $900,000 into those middle school programs across the district. We have uh, maybe our uh, most exciting in innovation is implementing at Walker um, those, the Paxton Patterson Lab with 17 different um, CTE modular stations. And we're planning to put in five more in the next six months or so. We spent about a hundred, a little over $100,000 on um, accelerated credit and college credit courses mostly at Willamette Promise, and that's through the ESD, where our, we're uh, providing dual credit opportunities in our existing classrooms for primarily core credit classes, which, which colleges would call lower division transfer credits, so they transfer to any university across the, the state. Sorry you said that. They don't. They only go to Western. Uh, so Willamette Promise, 
credits only go to Western now. They're the only one that will accept them of the higher ed universities in Oregon. Portland State won't, you know, Oregon won't, and OSU won't. Right. Um, okay, so that, yes, there's, so. there's a variety of different things there. We can get into a lot of technicality, but uh, the, the dual credit opportunities are, uh, are certainly expanded at all of our, high, all of our um, resident high schools. We also have our Perkins grants, our secondary pathway funds, and revitalization grants. And I, and I know I was, I was really here to talk about our high school success funds, but we braid a lot of those high school success funds with our other, um, our other funding sources. So uh, Perkins funds are federal funds that we might buy a piece of equipment, but we can't use that, that fe those federal funds to provide the infrastructure in a school. And so we might use our, our high school success funds at that school to provide uh, an electrical outlet and venting to put in a certain type of uh, tool. Uh, same thing with um, our revitalization grant. That's a middle school CTE summer camp grant. And we're able to offer uh, nine instead of just six camps for our middle schoolers with uh, blending those, those uh, high school success funds with our um, revitalization grant. Totally spaced there. The highlights that we have from that, if you, you can notice at the very end, our graduation rates for CTE completers is very high. The numbers of students participating in CTE programs is increasing each year to uh, 7,200 students this pa uh, past year, which is, that was, sorry, that was 2016-17, which is well over half of our students uh, at the high school level participating in career and technical education. Questions? I have a couple. Um, on the uh, Roberts CTE offerings, can you tell me what's currently being offered at Roberts? Sure, we offer early child, or actually an education pathway, which includes early childhood education and uh, uh, teaching all through the various teaching careers at our teen parent program. And then we, at both our um, structured learning center and our connections, two different sites but we offer at both places um, our business entrepreneurship program. And how much participation is there in these programs at Roberts? I, I don't know the exact numbers of students. Uh, that's the students that are, uh, I, I, I have to get back to you on that. Okay, yeah, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And then um, secondly, looking at, at the new programs that we're offering and, and evaluating the older programs that have been in existence, how do we, decide which programs are going to be ongoing, what, how, how do we gauge their successes, and how able are we to, um, to change course as new things arise, or, or we see that our program is maybe not as successful, or, or maybe has um, timed out as far as its relevancy? We have several programs across the district that are actually in that exact process, where we started years ago I think our computer-aided drafting is a, is a great example. Those are great programs. There are computer-aided drafting jobs, but primarily that is a, a skill that's utilized across a whole career pathway. And so we're transitioning those programs in, uh, in, mo in most cases to an engineering program where students will still have access to computer-aided drafting, but not as the whole program. That'll just be a part of the overall engineering. That's a great example of one. So we, we're continually looking at a variety of things, though. What, what we think students will take, uh, what we know mm -hmm. students are signing up for, what we know are our job projections in, in uh, our region. We know that, as an example, uh, health services programs, uh, health services type occupations are in very high demand across the country and locally. And so we're, one of our goals is to have a a health services program at each one of our comprehensive high schools, and we're still working on that. And actually, we'll start another one at South this next year. Does that answer? I have a few questions also. Okay. Go ahead. Um, do we have data on the percentage and the demographics of our students um, enrolled in CTE at every high school? Not by program. We have that by school, uh, the school-wide numbers, but we don't have that quite uh, disaggregated by 
program yet. We can, we're working on that, and I can get you by school if you'd like. That would be great. Okay. Yeah. And, and I want to make one comment. Uh, the diversity, no, the secondary pathways funding is given to specific programs. And the reason they get them, you're going to tell me that. There's the three things. The student earns three credits. We get a point in the bucket. If a student is underrepresented, we get another point in, in the bucket. And then if that student earns a, a certificate, a state-approved certificate, uh, we get another point. And then those points are collected, and they, we get allotment out of the overall pool. And we're getting quite a few dollars in that, which is one signal that we're getting a lot of diverse students okay. in those programs. Mm -hmm. But we can get the numbers school-wide. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, and then also, do we have um, something um, that shows the CT programs by high school, like what each high school offers as far as CT programs? Yes, I do. I'll bring those, uh, that's our uh, copy point brochure to the next meeting and make sure that everybody has those. Okay. And then um, one last question. Can we go back to the student access to accelerated credit and college level courses? Sure. Um, Director Pilo mentioned that uh, some universities are not accepting them. Um, do we know why which universities aren't? I know there was a, a comment that private universities do. Um, and which ones are the ones that do? That's uh, by each, each of the public universities in the state has their, has an option. And uh, it's a, it's kind of a technical uh, a way how each school, each university looks at it based on, um, I'm trying to think of the term that's used and I'm, it's escaping me. Cor correct. The, the issue comes down to it's not a university faculty member providing that instruction. Um, and they then, they then decide whether or not we can grant credit on their behalf. And so when it's a, when it's a structured program uh, that they sponsor, then they, they're the dual credit provider and they feel like their staff member is guiding that. Whereas this Willamette Promise is, goes through Western Oregon and Western Oregon accepts those and the other universities uh, do and don't depending on the courses that are offered. The and hardest one is um, Oregon State mm -hmm. and the Higher Ed Coordinating Commission and the Governor's Office and the Chief Ed Office and a number of superintendents have been pushing hard on that issue um, with Oregon State. I don't know that they've um, made progress yet. Um, do students know that ahead of time when they're taking these courses and they might be considering different universities other than Western that perhaps the credits that they're, they think might be transferring won't? Uh, yes and no. They know that the, those credit, you, our teachers know which schools certainly are accepting those. The question is whether or not um, they want to expend the money to <coughs> cover the cost. It's a cost of $30 a year for as many credits as they can earn. Um, so it's not a big cost. And students that, are, uh, are, that qualify for a free and reduced lunch, we actually supplement that cost with these dollars as well. So we, we have some, some room in there to help students um, select whether or not to take the credit accept the credit because they can opt out. They can still um, access the, a rigorous course and prepare them for college. I see. Okay. Sure. Thank you. But Jim, Jim, that's not our only courses. I mean, we have other no. AP and IB courses throughout the district. That are college, right. yes, These college rigorous courses. with the Battle Measure 98. Correct, funds. correct. I know my son is taking a course at Sprague. Correct. And he's getting OIT credit for it. Correct. We, yeah. Yes, we have some direct relationships and dual credit with universities. We have Willamette Promise, and we have AP and IB. This is just the augmentation of the ballot measure 98 funds for that. Correct. Yeah. Good clarification. Mm -hmm. Jesse? I would also like to see, alongside with what Adriana was pointing out about uh, the demographics of kids involved with uh, CTE programs in each school, uh, since we're talking about budget stuff, I'd like to see like the funds allocated to each school for their programs that they have and uh, have that in the same presentation as when we're talking about what students are involved. Okay. 
Is that easily accessible? <laughs> if we can probably get it by the next budget meeting, when is the next budget yeah. meeting? Yeah. Just as a reminder, before we start making a lot of requests of staff, let's we want to also make sure that yeah. it's doable and by when. So. Oh yeah, so, please. Yeah, thank you. And if it's doable. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Jim. Did you guys have questions, comments that you want to share? Lamenting an issue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Let's see. Okay. So, um, Craig, and, I'm sorry. Craig and Linda, again, on the Office of Behavioral Learning. I think I'm flying solo okay. on this one. <laughs> Just Craig. <laughs> Backed up by Lillian. Um, so the, the report that I wanted to talk with you a little bit about is about the Office of Behavioral Learning. The reason why we wanted to forward this to you is because as a school board, you've been hearing a lot about emergent student needs that are, that are popping up throughout the district, honestly throughout the state. Those of you who are OPB listeners might be following just this morning was the second part of of restraint and seclusion practices related to students exhibiting emergent student needs. Uh, they focused on Vancouver schools. They did uh, mention one of our students as well from, from Salem-Kaiser in that um, it was on the radio. And so it is, an, it is an issue that we're hearing a lot about and it encompasses a wide array of students who are showing up to us in need in ways that in the, in the past we haven't really needed to address because it's, it's an emergent thing that, that tends to be happening. We focus on some of the most disruptive behaviors which tend to happen at the elementary level, but there's also a lot of externalizing behaviors and internalizing behaviors happening at the high school level related to some of our suicide prevention things that are going on as well. So the Office of Behavioral Learning is a large umbrella organization that was actually just, or not an organization, a department that was created just two years ago. And it was our district's response to some of the things that we were hearing. Two years ago in 1718, the department was created with kind of seed money of $2.4 million. And what we did was take some existing positions and put them under this other, this new umbrella and fund new positions as well. It's our goal within the Office of Behavioral Learning to provide a continuum of services, which means we want to love up every kid and meet the needs of every kid when they come to us, regardless of the, whether they have really extreme needs or whether they have needs that can be met more universally just in a regular classroom setting. So when we talk about continuum of needs, some kids need things differently than others. So that's the idea behind the Office of Behavioral Learning. You can see the OBL strategies, the little table that's in there. And it's this notion of preventive and reactive strategies. Oftentimes with behaviors, we jump to reactive strategies, but a system that is whole and functioning well actually focuses on the preventative. So our schools and our district as a whole and OBL has been switching their focus more on preventative measures. So when you hear about things like a socio-emotional learning curriculum, every student who walks in our doors can benefit from a socio-emotional learning curriculum. So we, we take that as an approach to be able to get in front of more reactive behaviors that can come out for kids that may not have learned those things in other settings. So you can see for the preventative strategies, we have a school-wide PBIS, and, and PBIS is a positive behavior system, which kind of establishes the ground level of all supports in our district. We also focus on parent support groups, our SEL curriculum, or social and emotional. Functional behavior assessments, is, it's based on a medical model. So it's, it's the idea that instead of just constantly re reacting, when behaviors are emerging, we want to use behaviors as communication. So what is that student reacting to in the environment that we can do a better job of understanding the setting events and get in front of those setting events so we don't trigger what that could look like. Those of you who have spent time in our elementary schools the last year may notice that most of the lights, these lights like these, are, are now covered up in a lot of our classrooms with kind of shades. And it's because for some students, a really bright light in this direction can be a trigger. So it raises their anxiety just a little, 
but it raises it to that point where they then don't have the resiliency to deal with everyday behaviors and everyday things that come their way. So we try to make modifications to the learning environment. So things like that are how we try to set up our classrooms and set up our learning spaces so all kids can be successful. Even though we invest a lot in preventative strategies, we still have strategies that are considered more reactive. And one of our most effective strategies around that we found is having a highly trained behavior cadre. And I'll talk to you a little bit about what that looks like. It's our investment in people who are highly skilled, highly trained, and called to do this work. It's, it's difficult to work with kids who are, who are exhibiting these behaviors day in, day out. And it is hard work, but it's work that's made better with really good training. So we invest in people because people make the difference um, for that, and that's our behavioral cadre. We've also built de-escalation spaces in schools where if, as kids, you, you might remember Christy Cheever and her team from Highland talking about as kids, the upper mind and lower mind part, that as kids are starting to feel escalated, teaching kids to be able to understand their bodies and understand their minds and take a de-escalation on their own. So we built those spaces in a lot of our schools. We also use mental health therapists, and we um, have contracted some of those out ourselves, and we also have relationships with therapists um, from the county that come in and provide therapy in our schools. And then we also have some self-contained classroom supports, and I can talk to you a little bit about those as well. So you can see the program definitions, and I can you can wade through those yourself. Those are some of the um, different levels that we have within the continuum of supports. Any questions on that page? Can I have one. Mm -hmm. um, the the six point five FTE um, that has been or that was allocated, I guess, um, last budget. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, those six point five FTE is that a total for our entire um, school district, and how do they? Um, from school to school like good case. question if, if you look on the back I maybe I should have opened up questions after I went on the back because that one would have been <laughs> uh, that one would have been answered in this question you can see where it says behavior cadre okay so we have 33 behavior cadre and one thing that we've learned with this we're learning as we're doing this work there is no specific formula on how to do this but we've learned that what we're calling embedded cadre are more successful than at-large cadre Mm -hmm. So we started with keeping most of them at large to be able to send out to hot spots throughout the district. But they come into a school, they don't know the kids, they don't know mm -hmm. the teachers, they don't know the parents. Half of the, what they do is build those relationships to be able to understand that. So when we can get embedded cadre at schools that, are, that have students that are exhibiting high needs, it's, it's more effective. So we've kind of switched that model and now we have five that are more at large because we still need those when we have a student move in with um, high acuity or high needs, but we have most of them as embedded. So the total that we have right now are 33, and they're all classified staff. Okay. Thank you. Did you want to uh, let's prefer go over this? the back yeah, part over first, over and, then, um, and then then I can yeah. definitely answer your questions. So this just relates a little bit to some data that you would see about the number of referrals coming in at different, le different areas within the OBL. And then it also gives you an idea, kind of the scope of the work. So our social workers, we currently have seven social workers. One of them, though, is focused on suicide prevention trainings. So one of our social workers, that's pretty much her full-time focus for us. But we have a social worker for each high school feeder not assigned specifically just for the high school, but for the elementary schools and the middle schools as well in that feeder system. We also have the 33 cadre that we have talked about a little bit. Our behavioral consultant team is we have two school psychologists who are on the, who are focused specifically on helping school teams develop plans that work with students and families to be able to meet the needs of students that are exhibiting high needs. They also have the, one thing I really like about the behavior consultation team, it's not a one-time consultation and then you wipe your hands and, and leave. There is a long-term relationships with students. And so 
one of our psychologists, Chris Moore, has had relationships with students for four or five years and will go and drop in with those students in the middle school or high school that he met as fourth, fourth or fifth graders. So the, the idea of that is not a one-time done consultation. It's a levels of support across um, deep relationships with students. Our intake support team is for students who are moving into our district from residential or day treatment centers or, or coming from a more restrictive setting, even if it's not a day treatment center, coming from a more restrictive setting. And you can see that the numbers fluctuate and where we place those students kind of depends on the needs that they're exhibiting at that time. So they may be placed in an emotional growth center with a self-contained program, or they may be placed in a life skills center, um, or they may just be placed in our classrooms with additional supports kind of depending on where they're at. And that is a art and a science to place kids correctly who are exhibiting big changes and moving districts and moving schools and moving programs and then figuring out how to best support them. So that's our intake support team. And then for our student consultation intervention team, this is basically the district's version of a wrap team. So some of you may work, have, may have seen wraparound services where you try to bring as many different service providers to talk about one student and one family as you can to be able to holistically talk about the student. So our, our student consultation intervention team, they work together with um, lots of different community organizations, district employees as well, community members, parents of course are super important stakeholders there to be able to develop plans for kids. Okay. Ready for questions? Yeah, now we <laughs> no. now I'm ready for questions. Do we keep data either by school or by level on the number of room clears? Um we keep data not in a uniform way on that, but we do keep data by school on that and by program on the number of room clears. Okay. Yeah. Can I follow up on that really quickly? Mm -hmm. What's room clears? A room clear is where, um, because the way a student is acting out, they need to clear the room. They need to get the other students out of that room so that the support professionals in the room, whether it's a teacher, an aide, a school psychologist, whomever, work with that student. And it's health and safety issues for the other students, sometimes health and safety issues for that student that's acting out. Mm -hmm. But what it it's part of the OPB story is why I brought it yep. up because it leads yep. to um, yeah, lack of instructional time for those mm -hmm. other students that are in the classroom. So I was just wondering if we had data. I know it's a burgeoning area that districts are keeping data track of. Yeah. So I just wondered if we were. Yeah, we have anyway. program by program. I think that's a need okay. um, to be able to understand what that looks like. And that gets at who, whoever asked the equity question. Are you measuring the way this impacts the school as a whole because I think that it is a disruptive to the learning environment but if you're not used to seeing a, a child in trauma exhibit behaviors it's disruptive to the emotional well-being of those kids too mm -hmm. at the at, and the and our staff and teachers as well so I think that's a good question mm -hmm. okay. Kathleen sorry I have several no. um, can you uh, in the financial history section you have several things listed there um, that were in addition to the 2.4 million included in the general fund budget. Um, at some point, can you give us a total of the last budget session, how much went to this department? In, in the last total? two years? Yes. So the 2.4 as the base and then right. 47,000 and then the cost. So you're asking yes. for the cost of the 6.5? Yeah. Just to have that as a as a background. Sure. Um, second is, uh, are all the schools now using PBIS? Yes. Okay. And how long have we been using it? It's been a ramp up. And so we started with targeted schools five years ago, and then it's been slowly moving in. We have full implementation and relatively high degree of of the inventory, we have a PBIS inventory and see if it's being implemented well. And our district has a relatively high degree of implementation. But this is our second year of having all schools implementing it. So second it. year of full implementation. Right. And are we doing an analysis of the, um, the benefits of it? Are we seeing, is, is there some sort of um, way to evaluate whether the system is actually living up to its potential? 
Yeah. There's several different ways. One of the ways is our panorama survey, which is that's part of the reason our panorama survey is a socio-emotional learning survey, or not learning, socio-emotional survey that we've given to students as a way to be able to kind of establish a baseline of how are we measuring things like resiliency and grit and, and socio-emotional competencies. And so, and we just gave that for the first time this year to be able to see that. A lot of times you can measure things like discipline referrals, but it's, it's more of a, that's not a very finite way to, to really get at because there can be a lot of students who are benefiting from a system and, and but not, in, not reducing their referral rate. So we're trying to measure those things a little bit more. Okay. Yeah. Um, and and how, do, how does our district compare to other same size districts and demographic similarities? Uh, with regards to how much we're allocating for this sort of work? Oh, I don't know that question. That's a, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if, if the other three, because Beaverton, Portland Public, and us are the big three in the state, I'm not sure how Beaverton and Portland Public is resourcing for this. And I don't know if they're resourcing through an Office of Behavioral Learning, and so I don't know if we could actually compare and see it. Uh, we're going to do some work with Beaverton this summer around um, things that are in their budget, and, and that's going to be some of the questions we have for them. So, um, so I don't know if there's a standard way for us to get the information, but we can call, make a couple calls and um, see. Yeah. And so, obviously, you know, we see this sort of stuff in the news all the mm -hmm. time. It's, it's a high. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So just yeah. as a reminder, last, I think the last budget meeting, they gave a presentation on where we are with implementation and the known outcomes at this point so that that information is out there they've also yeah. given a couple of presentations to the board and i think alice has sent out the different links so that they are collecting that information they're reporting it so there's um, some great information that they've provided both to the budget committee and to the board and i think yeah. uh sorry to interrupt um we can relink those to the whole budget committee yeah. in an email that would be good. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Is it my turn? Yes. Okay. Um, so you talked about the functional behavior assessments, mm -hmm. um, and you talked about those light covers and stuff like that. Um, one, who who asks for the? Is it something that's coming down from the higher ups, um, as in please do this for these students, or is it teacher requested? And do we know what percentage of our rooms are taking advantage of those types of tools. Mm -hmm. There's an overall theory around this. It's called universal design. And so it's the idea that how can we set up our learning spaces to be able to allow all kids to have access to content, all kids to have access to show what they know within the learning environment. And so it's things around like flexible seating, mm -hmm. different lighting, yeah. placement in the classroom, things like mm -hmm. that. A lot of it is teacher generated. Yeah. Our, our teachers are the ones who know best, mm -hmm. you know, so when we can get an opportunity to sit and chat with them, the light thing was a perfect example. It, it was, it started at Four Corners from a group of teachers who tried it. They were turning off their lights and it was a little too dark in mm -hmm. the winter. So they thought, how could we, how could we experiment around with that? And so then it started with that. And now you walk in almost every building and, and it's that way. Um, so teachers are our best resource with yeah. this sort of thing to be able to know but there's also scientifically based practices as well so things like having um, brain gym exercises which allow kids to recenter themselves by working across the hemisphere mm -hmm. by drawing big eights on the wall right. by doing touch points across their body the pretzel you know things like that we know their research-based practices as well so I would say it's a, it's a little bit of top down and mainly are from our teachers yeah. so I have a sensory kid so okay. I know all about this so stuff. you know all yeah. of yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we get it um, so, so uh, one of my kids goes to uh, Candelaria and mm. one of my kids goes to Inglewood okay um, and so it's just interesting for me being in both schools every day um, and seeing just the disparity in like how things that there's just in, in one school would be really open. I feel like there's a lot more openness to those types mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. different seating, different types of, you know, lighting and stuff like that to where in oh. a different school, it's very much so not mm -hmm. in, in the, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of just the attitude of the school, if yeah. that makes sense. And yeah. so I'm wondering, you know, where 
if these are scientifically based, mm -hmm. I know from my own personal life that they help a mm -hmm. lot. Um, mm -hmm. How are we as a district kind of coming in to support those types of of movements going forward? Yeah. And you don't have to answer that. I just wanted to say okay. that. Um, so another thing I wanted to ask is, um, are we looking at, uh, you know, we've talked about seating, we've talked about lighting and stuff like that. Have we talked about food and nutrition at all? Because mm. I know that a lot of times the different, what these kids are gaining access to has a lot of really big impact on how their behavior is at school or what all they can handle in the school. Does that yeah. make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I don't know, has that ever, has that come up as, as a has, conversation piece? It's never come up in my conversations. Uh, I think it's a, it's a fascinating idea. Mm -hmm. And I, we do talk about food insecurity yeah. a lot and the stress that that can create in a system, particularly around, like we're very cognizant of it right now, like leading up to spring break, right. for instance. So some of our kids, that they, if they have food insecurity, mm -hmm. the amount of stress that they're bringing to school intensifies yeah. because they're worried how, how they're going to be able to eat over break. Sure. So we, we talk about food at that, but that's different than mm -hmm. what you're talking about, yeah. which is the actual food. Right, but you segued me into the trauma-informed care. So I understand trauma, uh, I read a lot about it. So, um, and I understand there's many different types of trauma. Yeah. Um, and so therefore there's lots of different training involved in the different types of trauma. How are our staff, are they equipped in those different, I mean, sorry, I'm having problems forming a question. But are they, are, do we have a good bandwidth of resources for different types of trauma in these situations? One of the things that we have in this district that I'm really proud of, though, which is different than in any other district I've been in, is that we have a counselor at every elementary school, and we have a cadre of counselors at middle school and a cadre of counselors at high school, and they lead the work on our trauma-informed care, and they are trained in the different modules they're trained in how kids can present different because you know trauma can present a lot of different ways mm -hmm. particularly as kids age in our system a a kid in a 16 year old in trauma is really different than right. a seven year old mm -hmm. so they do lead a lot of that work for us and that was a district expenditure to be able to place, especially in the elementary schools, it's somewhat rare to be in a system our large and, and to have counselors in every school, but this is exactly why mm -hmm. we need them in every school to be able to, they are the, the tip of the spear for us for that. Yeah, um, sorry for all the questions. Um, okay. The parent support groups, this was like, where are they? <laughs> yeah. Um, and how are we communicating? It's so funny. I. Um, work with the PTC at Inglewood, mm -hmm. and every time that we have a meeting, all the parents come in and they just wanna sit and talk to each other, right? Like, they view this as their parent support group. Yeah. Um, and so, seeing this on here, I haven't heard of any, like, formal things, so I'm wondering, one, where those are and how are we communicating that with our parents? Yeah, the, the parents that access these support groups are, are for, they're typically, their kids are exhibiting pretty high behaviors themselves, and we need to link our services across. And so like our PCIT training, which is really intensive therapy training as well that has a parent support group part of it, okay. to link the languages that we're using at school and on okay. the bus and at home together. So from the OBL, their parent support groups are f targeted for a, a subsection of our parents. They're not a, it's not a come around and, and, yeah. and that, um, which that could be another need. Could be. <laughs> <laughs> From what I'm hearing, yes. <laughs> yeah, so it could serve a different population, um, yeah. but it's not something that's in the purview of OBL. Okay. Um, but yeah. parents who do have kids that have these high needs um, in the school behavioral needs, there, there is systems in place for support for them. There are, okay. yeah, there are. And some of those are run by us and some of those are run by other health professionals as well in the community. Okay. okay. And they all can also access those in the wrap when we talked about the wrap services. Okay. That's how we get connected with those sometimes. Okay. I might like talk to you afterwards or something. Yeah. One, just one more question. The mm -hmm. two school psychologists that we have, mm -hmm. uh, is that enough? Um, you could probably say that question. I don't know if that's a question either. Um, yeah. You could say that for pretty much, if we had David sure. Fender here, the, who's the 
our, the person who coordinates all of this work, he would say we need twice as many social workers because right. our social workers, their caseloads are stretched too thin. We need twice as many embedded cadre because we need a cadre at every school, not mm -hmm. just 33. We have 60 some schools that we need cadre at. So he would probably tell you no. Okay. And, but what we are in, in what we are trying to figure out what is the base level of support that we need to be able to provide our kids the type of learning environments that they need. Where, what is that level? We have a pretty good idea for classroom supports, but we don't really know for behaviors yet and for social emotional learning, and we're, and we're struggling with that. This obviously, we, we can't grow this into a thousand people across our district to be able to serve the needs, and it's, and it's grown rapidly, so we're trying to right size it Great. Um, for that as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I have a couple questions, um, and one of them was sort of answered. Um, it was around the funding for um, these behavioral supports in our district, and it, I know that it comes out of our general um, fund. Mm -hmm. um, however, have we explored ideas in um, maybe partnering with like CCOs or um, oh, what was the other one? I just faced it. Yeah, um, or like OHP, um, mm. anything like that. I know that um, few school districts do have um, partnerships with CZOs, and then that kind of alleviates that aspect of our general fund. Just maybe throwing we, that out um, there. Haven't had a good um, partner. Not that they're not good partners, but the CCO <laughs> um, is, in our area hasn't partnered with school districts in the same way. I asked that question actually of the governor of where in your uh, budget is mental health support mm -hmm. for kids. We know that that's a big thing. And I believe her answer was um, we're pushing those towards our CCOs. So I think that there are other regions that it's a tighter partnership. Mm -hmm. um, our mental health counselors in schools, though, those are partners with Trillium and um, behavioral health, and those do not cost us for that uh, mental health counseling in the school. We provide the space. They access patient, their patients, our kids, for mental health counseling during the school day. So we've okay. done a little bit of that, but the CCO should really be our next place. Okay, and then one other question. Um, so it sounds like we have one um, social worker per feeder system. Is that including Roberts? Um, there's one who does a little bit of Roberts and a little bit of Roberts has several different sites and programs and so they coordinate with the counselors who are at, who has who are at Roberts or one of Roberts's sites and we have different uh, different ones at different numbers and so I just asked Linda this exact same question in anticipation of somebody asking this so um, so we have a counselor at CTEC at early college at teen parent and then at two other Robert sites, and they coordinate with the social worker. Okay, thank you. Love yeah, um, I hope you'll be able to answer this question. So are students who have behavioral challenges, but um, um, like get suspended or, or, be, or they're acting out, but are mm -hmm. not necessarily um, they don't have a diagnosis for uh, okay are they also able to access uh, this um, social worker supports mental health supports any of those other supports they are and and by a diagnosis would you mean like a special education well, so like like that they would could have be your um I don't know if I'm get, uh, getting too much into the weeds but I'm okay. thinking of a student that that talks back to a teacher okay and there's a history of, of them doing that, and mm -hmm. the teacher uh, ref might refer them for, uh, might give them a referral, mm -hmm. and or if you know if it escalates into some shouting or anything, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there's and it goes into a discipline the disciplinary track, mm -hmm. do, do those students still get to to have that additional support? They do, and that's that idea of that continuum of service. You described it really well of a student who some of them may be doing that every day, and they may be displaying something that we have a really difficult time trying to figure out. So we do a functional behavior assessment on that. We would meet with the, the parents, would be a key stakeholders within that, and try to develop a plan to have it not happening. Some students, it's all, it, it can be they're just having a bad day. 
<laughs> and so they're doing that as well. So within the OBL continuum of supports, you don't have to have a diagnosis to be able to access this at any point. That's one thing I really like about it, that a, a student who is having a bad day or they're, they're, let's, hypothetically their parents are breaking up or they're moving or they are going through a difficult time, those are situational things that our system supports pretty well, I think. Yeah. And last question, and this might be more for Chrissy or, or Michael, but um, the is the f funding for the school resource officers, is that part of the general fund or is that uh, grant funding or? or yeah. It's general fund. General fund. Uh -huh. okay. What, well, if you can look it up, what, where would I be able to find it on the budget? Yeah. It's in the, it's in the safety and security budget. It is, um, yeah. I don't know what. I, I can look been, it up. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, it wouldn't be a separate line item just for the SRO contracts. Um, but if you're interested in that amount, we can clearly provide you with that information. Yeah, if it's not too much. Yeah, yeah. sure. Isn't the SRO a shared cost between us and the city? Or is that incorrect? It, it is a shared cost. We pay 50% of, of an officer's time for nine months of the year and let me just say the reason why I brought it up with during this presentation is because if it does escalate into some kind of violence it's not unthinkable that an SRO might be brought into mm -hmm. um, to a classroom to deal with some with some situations and even though it would be unfortunate um, it's not I don't think it's unfor um, unthinkable no and Unfortunately, it's not unthinkable. The whole idea of our system is, to, and you mentioned suspensions as well, we, we know suspension or expulsion as a tool does very little to teach kids behaviors, how to, how to exist. And so we want to get in front of that and do it preventatively as much as we can. Unfortunately, that's not, we can't do that all the time. Okay, thank you, thank you. And then I think our last presentation is by Linda and it's on class size. All right, last page in your packet. And let me just frame the conversation around class size this evening will be focused on budget implications of class size, not instructional implications or behavioral implications. So we really are just going to look at numbers. And I also want to frame that for you, sometimes numbers around class size are difficult to really make any informed decisions about. So you'll see numbers presented to you in different kinds of charts, and that was done on purpose, and we'll move our way through those individually, and I'll give you some background on each of those. So for instance, starting with the elementary chart, this provides you two years of data and the number of students in each class are divided out by grade band. And then we've actually provided counts for you classrooms with 24 or fewer, classrooms with 25 to 29, or classrooms with 30 or more. So looking over time, you will see a decrease in the classrooms with 30 or more students across each grade band. And you will see that about 90% of the classrooms in K3, so those first two grade bands, are less than 30 students. So the district has prioritized class size in different ratios for classrooms K2, K3, and 3-5. There also is a different allocation calculation for classrooms in title schools and classrooms in non-title schools when staffing is allocated to classrooms. So up in the overview statement there, the second sentence, as a point of reference to reduce the average class size by one student across K-3, that cost is approximately $2.3 million. And that's just to provide some perspective, some reference for you. So the number of classrooms is a manageable way to calculate and track class size data at elementary school. 
before I move on, Marty, did you have a question? So, uh, but the cost of 2.3 million is just really in FTE. It's not in facilities. Is that correct? Correct. It, I, there is no consideration for whether we would even have the feasibility to accommodate that. And I want to just make a comment. You, there was some testimony at the previous board meeting about kinders with 30. I think I have not researched it specifically, but I think that school actually the number way, the reason we couldn't add FTE, we had teachers to add, I believe was because of facilities. And so we're um, in, if it's a school I'm thinking about, we're moving um, a couple of programs to different schools in order to be able to add. So it was a facilities issue, I believe. Not 100% sure. How do we find classroom? We're not talking cafeteria as classroom. If there, gym well, so there's a note. So let me, office. yeah. So the definition right now. So these are teachers assigned to students. So this is not defined by their physical space. And so the reason I want to clarify that is this: these numbers do not include PE teachers and the classes uh, that they see, or music teachers. It also does not include self-contained classrooms. So what does the word classroom mean then? So a classroom. As I look at these numbers. Sure. So this would be in the most traditional sense. I guess I want to make sure that I'm answering the question that you're asking. Um, so if we have students that are, that if we have transitioned to say a computer lab into a classroom, but that is a primary location where students receive their instruction from a teacher, then yes, that would be counted as a classroom. I'm just trying to understand the table. Um, can you under, can you explain to me? I, maybe I missed it. This you have a minus whatever, or, or a that's just a dash. So oh, it's, a dash. it's a number and the corresponding percentage, so that you have. <laughs> that's right. So it gives you both the count okay. and the percentage. And the reason that's important is because the total number of elementary classrooms has dropped from 2018 to 2019 due to decreased enrollment at the elementary level. Thank you very much. You're welcome. OK, so moving to the middle school table, um, you'll notice that the chart is organized differently. This is not the best way, perhaps, to present class size numbers to you, but it's about the most manageable way, um, providing you the kind of depth and context for the middle school, middle school class sizes would require an extremely long report or about 17 pages of information. So uh, what we did try to provide for you is some context across content areas. So specifically, the secondary team believed it was important for you to see the difference between the four core content areas, language arts, math, social studies, and science, compared to class size in electives and then the support courses, so reading support or math support. So what you'll see is that in general, middle school class size increased from 2017 to 18 to the current year, 18-19. This is mostly connected to the increased number of students in grades 6 through 8 and the lapse in FTE following that increased enrollment. So um, if and when we were to add another column on this table and you would see 2019-20, uh, we have now made adjusted FTE allocations to middle schools. Essentially, we had a bubble of students that moved through the elementary grades, and we have one year, one more year of bubble. We have a very large fifth grade class, classroom that will continue to transition into middle school. Uh, so we're keeping an eye on that. But uh, as that bubble has rolled up into middle school, it's taken us just a bit to make sure that we have allocated the FTE appropriately to meet those needs. So uh, relatively close in class size, but you do see uh, just a slight increase at middle school. And those numbers for electives include PE and They do. And so, so keep in mind, um, electives are a dangerous place to deal with averages right. because you also have CTE classes that might have um, eight students in them in a stacked scenario. So you see that more at the high school than you do at the middle school. But remember, when you're dealing with averages, we may have an upper level uh, digital media course, digital media two, digital media three, digital media four where you have 24 students in, sitting in the physical classroom at the same time, but they represent those three different courses altogether. 
Or so, you're not going to have orchestra that has 48. Exactly. Or, and on the flip side, you have the average of a band class, an orchestra class, a choir class, or a theater class that may have, um, you know, potentially up to 70 kids. So the averages <laughs> get tricky. So can I ask an additional question? With the PE mandate coming at us, are we going to be able to break that out for our K through 8s then to see how we're doing with that? How are you kids are we assigning to PE classes? Because with the PE mandate coming, I mean, we could have 146 kids in a middle school PE class. That's Thunderdome going on right there. But yeah. it'd be kind of nice to know how many kids we're putting into a PE class. We could specifically pull numbers on PE. Um, I will tell you that they're higher than probably we would like. Um, we do have some caps in place just for safety reasons. Obviously, you can't run physical movement, but I think that's a separate conversation. I think we would want to be careful in putting those two conversations together when we talk about the required instructional minutes and activities for PE, which are partially hindered not just by staffing but by facilities. Right. So um, I think we could engage in that conversation, but we'd want to parse out what are really the outcomes of both of those limits. High school? Okay, high school. So again, you'll see uh, same, follows the same format as the middle school. Uh, you will see that in the high school classrooms, there has been a concerted effort to reduce class size, and that specifically has focused on targeting class size in those support classes, intervention courses. Um, that looks a little bit different at each high school. Those high schools have been able to allocate their FTE to meet the best to best meet the needs of their individual student population. But there has been a systemic response to putting fewer kids in each individual section of a reading support or math support class in order to ensure that they get more time from the teacher and really targeted assessment and instruction. That also aligns with the proficiency work that our high schools are doing. So what we're really trying to do is target what are the specific skills and standards that individual students are missing and that they, they need support in, and then only requiring those students to receive instruction and stay in a support class while they're getting instruction on those specific standards. So that's been a bit of a shift, and that's why there's such a significant drop getting those classes down to 17-ish. I have a question. Um, I don't even know how to ask this question. <laughs> so when we talk about the average class size in high schools, I know that we're taking a look at it um, throughout our entire district, right? Mm -hmm. However, um, we know that high schools like McKay have just overcrowded classrooms and we've heard through testimony from students and teachers that some classes there are students that don't even have desks. Um, we've also heard that a lot of our students can't even get into lunch um, because of just the overcrowding in that school. How are we, um, how are we taking a look at, at that specific mm -hmm. Um, challenge in yeah. our school district and what are we doing to I know that it's a much greater um, issue and we're trying to solve it through boundaries and right. bond um, but what are we doing um, to target schools like McKay to ensure that one every student that is going to class is having a seat right um, that they can get the education that they're going to get and that they're getting a lunch um, that is very important. So um, I'm glad you acknowledged that some of that is facility restrictions and so I think again we would need to parse out the two separate mm -hmm. issues so students struggling to get through the hallway or struggling to get to their locker in time for a classroom or having to stand in a long line for lunch those are facilities based issues we have too many high school bodies in McKay High School and so the boundaries should relieve some of that. Um, in regards to specific class sizes there are actually 
across the six comprehensive high schools, the class sizes are pretty commensurate. Um, but remember, there are individual decisions that are made at each high school on purpose to meet individual student needs. One of the strategies at McKay specifically in listening to their curriculum assistant principal and the way that they've built their master schedule, they made very intentional decisions about their ninth grade core classes and pushing as much FTE into those classes so they're very small for math, English, science and social studies, but what that has done is blown up their ninth grade electives. Mm -hmm. So they have made a purposeful decision. They know that they're dealing with classes of 45 and 46 for ninth graders in their electives, and they have agreed to live within those constraints because they have been incredibly purposeful about choosing to flood FTE into their ninth grade core. So um, I think building stresses and pressures of having too many kids in an overcrowded setting is one issue. I think the class size issues, you really have to dig. Uh, our secondary leadership team spent quite a bit of time with, with each of the individual high school administrative teams for that exact reason, trying to say where are the push and pull points and what are the decisions that you're making on purpose that escalate or de-escalate numbers and classes and what are the things that you can't yet manage because you don't have the resources to do so. I was um, wondering about a theory of actually is there some inequity in our FTE allocations based on the numbers of kids, the way we assign FTE, and the drivers in a master schedule when you have a, um, a school like maybe West that can put a bunch more kids in the, math, in the marching band, mm -hmm. does that actually drive down class size in a more affluent school? And so I, I pushed that because of the testimony, that exact question. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what Linda and the secondary team did. They went high school by high school to understand the master schedule um, to fi figure out what drives class size. And every high school had something that drove mm -hmm. um, class size. So I think she said I was wrong. But um, <laughs> very politely. Very politely. <laughs> very yeah. politely. But we, we just wondered about it, given the testimony yeah. about it. Question. You just said they agreed to this smaller core classes at ninth grade, saying that they would live with the bigger classes outside the core. Who is they? Well, the administrative team, the leadership team at the oh. school, and I don't know who sits on their leadership team. I know they vetted their master schedule through, that's the terminology they used, leadership team. I don't know the specifics of who sits on that. Because obviously the teacher that spoke to us was not part of the right, they. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, no, there's someone bearing the brunt of, yeah, nope, I get it. Got it. Thank you. That was really helpful. Very helpful. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna uh, just, whoops, let's see. Okay, just real quick, um, our next meeting is so Ellen, sorry did you have a question I'm yes sorry. if we have questions that have been generated that we think of on the way home tonight or yeah. want some more data <laughs> or something who would we send those requests to uh, let's see what was our practice? yeah okay. uh, how about you send them to me and then we'll I'll vet them through budget committee leadership yeah especially if they're data related mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yes I know <laughs> oh. And, okay, oh, here is, okay. So uh, the next budget committee meeting is April 23rd, and that will be when we will hear the superintendent's uh, budget presentation. And then also April 9th is um, a regular board meeting. And a lot of times there's information that is very relevant to the budget process. Um, we get, you know, updates from staff on programs, so. Um, so stay tuned and I think that's it is that it okay well thank you well, that's good timing that's eight o'clock oh sorry uh, when do we vote on uh, chair and vice chair for the budget committee um, I believe that is after yeah at the first meeting um, so at the budget com the uh, budget message on the 23rd on the 23rd yeah. yes yeah. okay so that's it thank you for being here thanks for thanks. taking the time so we're adjourned thank you.